Welcome to Hope at Night, featuring Joshua Holly, Chris Holland, Q&A with our live audience, and host Anil Kanda. Today's episode, Free From Me? And here's your host, Anil Kanda. Welcome to another episode of Hope at Night. A 21-year-old got the ride of his life when his electric wheelchair got lodged in the grill of a semi-trailer. Ben Carpenter had started to cross an intersection in front of a semi when the light turned green. The truck started moving and the wheelchair handles got stuck in the grill. Carpenter was pushed down the highway for several miles at about 50 miles an hour. Fortunately, a pair of police officers happened to spot what was happening and pulled the truck over. While the wheelchair wheels lost most of their rubber, Carpenter escaped unscathed, a little shaken up, but glad to be finally free. Have you ever felt stuck doing something you didn't want to do? Does it sometimes seem like no matter how hard you try, you remain a slave to bad habits and addictions, being helplessly dragged through life much like Ben Carpenter was? Is freedom even possible? Today, we'll meet a young man who found himself in a maximum security penitentiary at the age of 18, but he was stuck in more ways than one. We'll find out more about the incredible story of how he found freedom in every sense of the word. Let's welcome to Hope at Night, Joshua Holly. <laughs> Joshua, I'm glad you're here. Yeah, good to be here. Much better than being in a, a maximum state penitentiary. <laughs> Would you say that that's to be true? true? That's true. This is a much better setting. <laughs> much better setting. Now, I got to start off by asking you this. How in the world did you end up in a situation like that? Well, I, I wasn't raised a Christian. Uh, my, my family, they weren't um, Christians at all. And so they just kind of lived the ways of the world. They were, unfortunately, they were both addicts. And so I got caught up into that as a young age, um, 12, 13 years old, drugs. And, and unfortunately, when I was 16, 17, you know, I was listening to rap music, very, very influenced by music. And I started trying to imitate the things I was listening to in the music. And I, I did some bad things. I tried to rob somebody, unfortunately, and I went to prison. And I spent eight years and three months in the penitentiary in Oof. Oklahoma. What was life like in a penitentiary? Well, it was what you could imagine. It was um, not a life to be desired. You were, you were trapped. You were locked up. Um, you were around a lot of bad people. Um, it was a, it was a wake up call. I was actually, I was 17 years old when I first went to prison and, but I turned 18 years old at the maximum security prison. So it was a, it was a huge wake up call for me because I, I wasn't raised, you know, knowing about Jesus, knowing anything about, you know, a better life. And I thought I was desiring this, um, worldly life, this gangster life. And then I was face to face with it. And I saw then that this is, this is not the life that I want to live, not the life that I want to continue to live. What were some of the difficulties you encountered while you were in prison? Some of the difficulties, um, gangs, um, fighting. And it's interesting too, because you would think in, in prison that there wouldn't be drugs and crime, but there were a lot of drugs and it was all around. And it was a very violent world too. There were fightings and, and killings. I, I saw some things in there that you know, was, was very sad. I saw some people get very hurt in prison. And even though I didn't know about Christ, I can look back and I see that God had his hand on me the whole time I was in prison and he was always protecting me. Right. Some people think that prison <clears throat> life, you're behind bars, there's restrictions there, there's not much you can do, but there yeah. is another society in yeah. prison. Yes. Wow. Yeah. A whole nother life. Right. It, it's, it's, it's a whole different world, a whole different world. How long were you in there for until you got out? I went um, September of 2002 and I got out November 5th, 2010. Do you remember the very day that you walked out of prison? I do, I do. What was going through your mind at that moment? You know, there was, it, the leading up to getting out was, um, it was exciting, but it was, it was, surprisingly, it was a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress, you know, a lot of worry. 
um, you know, about the future. You know, I was, I was locked down in a maximum security penitentiary. And so going, going from that to freedom, you know, there was a little bit of nervousness. And then uh, the people that usually get out of prison, they don't, it's not a good statistic um, for staying out. Um, I know a lot of people that just end up going right back. And so there was some concerns, but it was, it was exciting. I was, I was very, very thankful for the opportunity to, to come home. Wow. Yeah. Uh, how did you find God? Well, that's a very interesting story. Um, when I was in, when I was in prison, I, I gave my life over to the prison life, to, to gangs and drugs and just, you know, all the things that I thought I had desired. And I completely didn't know about God and didn't really care about God. And so I considered myself an, an atheist. Um, looking back, I think maybe I was more of just an agnostic. But after six years in the penitentiary, um, I had left the maximum security penitentiary and went to a medium security for like six months. But some things happened and I got in trouble and I got sent back to the maximum security penitentiary. And when I was there, you know, it's, I think I was 23 years old, somewhere around there, it was 2008. You know, I think my, my frontal lobe started developing and I started kind of thinking like, what am I doing with my life? And I started wondering if I was ever going to get out of prison. And I, the real big question I was, I was questioning is if I even cared about getting out of prison. I was just so caught up in this life. Mm -hmm. And there was a very deep depression that came upon me. Um, I, never, I never consider myself suicidal, but there came a point in my life when I did not want to live anymore. And I remember getting up one morning, mm -hmm. had all these horrible thoughts in my mind, not wanting to live, not knowing anything about Jesus Christ either. And I got up one morning and I was staring out my prison cell door and as I was staring out my prison cell door, I had a real experience with God. Like I, I felt like a presence coming to my prison cell. And some people might question that, but it was an experience and I felt like the presence of God, like all the hair on my neck stood on end, all the hair on my body stood on end. And I believe God spoke to me and it's not, I didn't hear a voice, but there was this overwhelming impression. It was so strong. It was like, like I knew this was God speaking to me. And I was, I was heavily impressed that God was real and the Bible was true. It was like a deep like impression that I'll never forget. You felt this embrace I, of yes, God in the midst of all yes, this. Yes, it, it was like I was at my lowest point of life, like ready to give up. And then like the grace of God that I didn't even know about. I didn't know about the grace of God. I didn't know about Jesus Christ. And it was just poured out upon me. That's and it's interesting too, because I know that was God because the depression, the anxiety, the suicidal thoughts, vanished just dissipated disappeared because it, it was all thinking about the unknown not not knowing if there's a god not knowing if there's a future hope and at that moment like i knew i knew that god was real and the bible was true and a little bit of time goes by i started reading my bible i read the book of romans and i never read the bible before i'd never prayed before but i remember some of the things i was reading in romans like i think it was romans 8 romans 8 verse 11 where it says, if the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, then he shall also quicken your mortal bodies. When I read that, I was like, there was this hope in my heart, like that I don't have to continue living this sinful life. Because even though I was in prison, I was, I mean, I was trapped physically, but I was trapped spiritually too, like in sin. But when I read that, it was like, oh man, God is trying to not just give us eternal life, but he's trying to give us life here and give us victory over sin here. There, there's a freedom he promised. There's a freedom. And I remember reading that and that hope sprung up in my heart and I never prayed before, but I bowed my head and prayed for the first time. And that same presence came in the back of my prison cell. It's only two times this has ever happened in my life. But like the grace of God was just poured out upon me. And again, I didn't, it was God speaking to me. I know it was, but I didn't hear a voice. But it was this overwhelming impression that God was saying, keep reading. And man, that's what I did. I went on an intense Bible study. How, how did that experience change your whole outlook on life? My life has not been the same since. You know, I'm still on a journey, you know, seeking to, you know, live up to the high calling that Jesus has called each one of us to live. But it, my entire, it was a complete paradigm shift. Like I was just living life myself like in prison, and a lot of people are doing that, just living life, not, not knowing that God has something better. And it was like the moment that I knew that there was something better to life, that my whole trajectory has changed, you know? Did the other inmates notice the change? Did oh, the prison was, guards <laughs> notice the change? It, was, it wasn't just me. I could tell you about my cellmate. <laughs> my cellmate was in there for, so he was in there for two counts of murder. 
He spent 15 years in prison and he was tattooed from his neck down. And God completely transformed that man too. Like it was, it was not just me, but it was like my prison cell. And he's out of prison right now too. He's, he's serving the Lord faithfully as he can. But God, God came into the prison cell, changed my life, changed my cellmate's life. And everybody, all my friends, they had thought I was crazy, you know, because then I was telling them all about Jesus and sending them Bible verses and... Wow. Mm. How else did God continue to lead your life when you're in prison? Well, as I um, was studying my Bible, um, I had a, a couple of, another interesting experience. As I was studying my Bible and I was questioning, you know, some different things I was reading, um, my cellmate got up one day and we were talking about creation. We were talking about evolution. We were both believers in evolution. And even when I, I was reading the Bible, I still believe maybe God worked through evolution. I had these, I just wasn't sure. And my cellmate got up one day and he found a book that was underneath our television. And he picked it up, he looked at the back and he said, hey, this looks like it might be a good book and he handed it to me. And I opened it up and as soon as I started reading this book, like I felt like the Lord was speaking to me through this book. And it was called Patriarchs and Prophets. And the chapters are identified, like the first chapter says this is based on Genesis 1 and 2. But I sat there on the edge of my bed, read like 140 pages of this book, didn't move. I read the whole book in two days, then I went back and started it again with the Bible. What, what is Patriarchs and Prophets all about? It is a powerful book that shows Christ all through the Old Testament. It reveals the great controversy that we're in. You know, the Bible talks about there's a war in heaven. You know, it, it, it does talk about it, but the Patriarchs and Prophets really brings it to light to show this great controversy battle that we're in. Like we are, we live in a physical world, but we live in a spiritual world too. We are, we are in a daily spiritual battle for our lives. And Patriarchs and Prophets revealed that. But not only that, it gave the most logical, scientific explanation for a seven day creation. Okay, wait, let me get this right. <laughs> Here you guys are, you and your fellow inmate yeah. in, that, mm -hmm. in that prison sub. Yeah. You guys were, were turning to the Lord, and you guys mm -hmm. were thinking about the idea of creation and evolution, yeah. and you happened to find this book yeah. that was a commentary on the Old Testament yeah. about the book of Genesis, about creation, yeah. a, a book I've read too that's just been so yeah. amazing. Amen. And you found that book, and it was being used under the, did you say it, under the TV? It was holding up our television. It was all beat up. Half the cover was ripped off. It was all stained. It was old. <laughs> How long do you think that book was in there for? You know, probably years. Wow. Probably years. I, I always like to think that, you know, maybe an angel, <laughs> you know, brought it to my prison cell. But yeah, yeah, it was a beautiful book. Wow. Beautiful book. There it remained for some time yeah. until the right time, right? Yeah, amen. Wow, fantastic. Yeah, was there another book? Yeah, so a year later, the same thing happens. Um, me and my cellmate are studying the Bible, we're reading the Bible, we're discussing things, we were learning about prophecy, and we both got moved to a new prison cell. And in this new prison cell, I looked under the bed and there was two stacks of books. Um, they were like a stack like this, there were two of them, and they were taped together. Somebody was using them to exercise on. And so I got them out one day and I'm thinking about prophecy and all the things I've been learning from the Bible and I'm, I'm doing push-ups. And as I'm doing push-ups, I look, and right here in the middle of these books, it's a book called The Great Controversy. And I cut the book out, I open it up, and it was the exact same experience. Like, this book was answering all my questions about prophecy and the questions that me and my cellmate were having. And it was a book I believe was inspired by God. Okay, so here you are, mm -hmm. you, you started reading the Bible, you're having these powerful mm -hmm. experiences with God. Uh, you have questions about creationism, yeah. and boom, uh, there's a yeah. book about the Old Testament, about the yeah. book of Genesis. Uh, a little bit later, you have questions about prophecy. Yeah. You're working out one day, yeah. and as you're doing that push-up on the, the incline, I should say, yeah. there you are, you see a great controversy, yeah. a book about prophecy, yeah. and you started reading that. Yes, sir. <laughs> How did things change for you? You know, it just, it opened my mind up to see that God has a truth, you know, and He has a people, uh, He has a people too here on earth, you know, that, that have a truth for, for, for the world. You know, we have a we have a ministry of reconciliation to draw people to Christ. And so it was very encouraging um, when I found these books. They, they enlightened my mind to the things that I, that I was wondering that I didn't know about. And even patriarchs and prophets, you know, in the, in the Christian world and or the way, the way that it was presented to me, you know, there's always such a separation between the God of the Old Testament and then the God of the New Testament. You know, it almost seems, seems like it's two separate 
you know, God's when it's not. You know, it's Jesus Christ all through the Bible, but patriarchs and prophets really brings it out and shows how it was Christ all through the Old Testament and, go, and shows why some of the things were happening that were happening. But it gives, it gives a lot of evidence and a lot of encouragement um, to the inspiration of the Bible. It really emphasizes this idea yeah. of God is love, right? Yes, amen. Wow, and that's been life changing. You found yeah. freedom in Jesus, amen. right? Yes, sir. Wow. And, and the great controversy too, you know, today I, I go door to door and I distribute that book. Um, it's something that God has called me to do um, because I believe that book through the prophetic history that it shows, I mean, it, it's a bold statement, but I, I like to say it, that it proves the Bible. You know, and that's what it does. That book, just through the prophecies and all the different things it brings out, like it, it shows that the Bible is trustworthy. It's, it's a believable book. And so I, I found a, a huge blessing by taking it door to door, sharing it with people. I um, had some amazing experiences doing that too. Joshua, let me throw this out to you. Mm -hmm. There's somebody who's probably listening, maybe someone who's watching, who may be in a prison cell, and it may not be a physical prison cell. It yeah. may be a spiritual one a mental one, yeah. maybe an emotional one where yeah. they're trapped. Yeah. Maybe they're, they're struggling under addictions. They mm -hmm. feel worn out. Yeah. They feel guilty. They don't know where to go. Mm -hmm. They don't know who to turn to. What would you say to someone like that? You know, I would say that God not only loves you, but He believes in you. And that's an interesting thought, you know, because sometimes we don't believe in ourselves. And if we're in those, you know, trapped, if we're trapped in sin, whether it's jail or whatever, you know, it's maybe our friends and our family don't believe in us, but God does. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. And no matter what you're struggling with today, like God can give you victory. I'm not perfect, but I can see how God has given power in my life and he's given me victory over sin. And, you know, sin is very deceiving. God has something so much better for us and God believes in us. He believes in the people that are struggling right now. And he just wants us to believe in him and lay hold of his promises and God can change anybody's life. Wow, that's so beautiful. I remember one day I, I, I said this prayer, Lord, show me your heart. Mm -hmm. Show me where your heart is. Later on that day, one of my friends, uh, they had to go visit a prison. Mm -hmm. um, their fiance was in prison, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And so, or I should say jail. And so we went to go visit the jail and he was you know, we're talking to him mm -hmm. behind the glass screen and, you know, and my heart just went out mm -hmm. for him. And later on that day, as I was driving home, it dawned on me, God showed me where his heart was. Mm -hmm. It was for people who had been in prison, uh, not just also Amen. a physical prison, yeah. but a spiritual prison. Right. He was compassionate Amen. towards them. He was showing me that Amen. he has a heart for these people. Yes, right. those are God's people. That's he right. loves them. That's right. And yeah, so, you know, anybody that's listening or watching right now, don't, don't ever give up on anybody. Don't give up on yourself and don't give up on your friends and family because God is powerful and he can change anybody. Joshua, that's so beautiful. Thank mm. you for sharing with us yeah. today. We've been talking with Joshua Hawley and hearing his incredible story of how he found freedom while incarcerated at a maximum security penitentiary. We'll be back to dig more into the idea of how we can find victory over the things that tie us down. Don't go away. Welcome back to Hope at Night. We met with Joshua Hawley earlier and found out how, while serving out his sentence in a maximum security penitentiary, he found victory and freedom in Jesus over the things that tied him down. We're going to explore this issue more with our next guest. Please welcome to Hope at Night, Dr. Chris Holland. Oh, glad you're here. Chris, come on in, take a seat. Dr. Holland, we're glad you're here. Glad to be here. Could you share with us a little of your journey of how you got to this point in life? Well, that's a long story, but I know we don't have all night. So, you know, I grew up in a Roman Catholic home and, um, you know, our family, I would not call our family incredibly devout. We went to church on a weekly basis, but I never really experienced, and, I, and I'm not blaming a church it, for my personal journey. I didn't really have an experience where I could say that I was a follower of Jesus. And um, there were a couple of significant events that happened in my life 
when I was 14 years old, I'll not forget, I lived in the Chicago area and my, my father took me to the uh, 1989 uh, football playoff game between the Chicago Bears and the San Francisco 49ers. And I remember it well because it was about 30 degrees below zero that day. And, uh, and then on top of that, which made it worse, is the Bears lost. Uh, and, uh, and then... Um, my dad took me out to eat and I'll not forget, you know, you know, the, these moments in life, uh, we went to a Chinese restaurant, but the food was horrible, but we ate it because we were so cold that we just <laughs> wanted something warm in us. And it was at that time that my dad told me that he and my mom were going to get divorced. Wow. And, uh, and my parents, you know, I mean, for 14 years, I mean, that's, that's all I knew. I right. had three younger brothers. Uh, and when that happened, it was kind of interesting. You know, my parents were involved with the church and and I want to be clear, I don't hold anything against a church or anything like that. But as a young 14 year old, I saw what happened is that no one from the church came. Wow. Priest didn't come. Uh, other leaders in the church didn't come. And when that happened, uh, like you, I, I don't know that I was ever an atheist, but um, I came to a place and I said, you know, I don't know if God exists and I'm not sure he exists here. And then I went on this journey uh, looking, trying to figure out all so, this stuff. Dr. Holland, what I'm hearing is that, you know, growing up, you know, obviously you encountered this, this, this horrible experience of your parents yeah. separating and then seeing the church not being really responsive yeah. during a time of need and crisis to yeah. you. So this really began to reshape your ideas or, or maybe shape your ideas sure. about God in a certain way. Yeah. Can you continue? You know, you kind of sprinkle the extra salt on, so to speak, of I was very angry and I played uh, American football and that's how I dealt with my anger. And you know, if there's a psychologist out there, that's not a good way to deal with your anger. Well, I, probably not, but it's how right, I dealt right, with right. it. That all came to an end about two years later where I was playing a game and a guy hit me from behind, another guy hit me from the front and my knee bent in ways oh. that uh, not designed to bend. Uh, and I have several scars to show it. And I basically spent my entire sophomore and junior year on crutches. And so this outlet for me to deal with my anger was gone. Wow. And so I turned to what really five generations in my family have turned to, and, um, and that was addictions, primarily alcohol. And so I'm in this very confused spiritual condition. I'm seeking out answers kind of half-heartedly, and I'm dealing with my other issues, drinking alcohol and all this other kind of stuff. And so uh, long story short, Anil, I was, uh, I was a mess. I was a big mess. So here you are in this situation, just what you're describing. I mean, I can imagine as a, was it your sophomore and junior year? Yes. Uh, this is a time you're full of energy, you're That's full right. of life, you're ready to try out new things, and here you are, you're in crutches, you can't yep. move. Yep. That must have been really discouraging. It was very discouraging. I had three knee surgeries before the end of my junior year, and so, uh, and, and there was a pivotal moment, I'll, uh, and people laugh at this when I say this. My doctor said, hey, you're done, your football days are done, and listen, I don't have illusions to grandeur. I wasn't gonna play in the NFL. I might have played in a small college, but, the doctor said, hey, you can't play football, but you can still wrestle. And so I was a wrestler and I'll never forget, I went through all this intensive rehab uh, after these major surgeries on my knee and I was uh, not al allowed to do live drills until the trainer cleared me. The day he cleared me, my first live drill, I went in on a guy to take him down and I blew out my knee. Again. Oh no. And so I was 17 years old. You know, you're supposed to be macho and right. tough, football player, wrestler. And I laid on the mat and I wept like a baby. Wow. And I remember saying, and, and you know, and it's funny how we turn to God in moments like this. I said, why God are you letting this happen to me? Like I had any relationship with him anyways, but that's the natural thing to do, right? right. We blame God for bad things and we, you know, cheer ourselves on when good things happen. And right, that's right. where I was in my life. And, right. and so that's where I was in this just, pile of mess, really. It's like this atheist I met one time, we were just talking and as we're talking, he's like, you know, at the end of the day, I'm just angry at him. And I said, wait a minute, how are you angry at someone you don't believe in? Yeah. <laughs> and that's, and that's kind of where I was. I wasn't willing to embrace the idea that we were just some 
accidental occurrence and the mixing of the proper amino acids and somehow all of this came to be. I was not willing to go there. Right. So I went on this search and I'll tell you, uh, Anil, it's an interesting thing. I found God in all places and of all places at the Speedway gas station at the corner of Ironwood in Ireland in South Bend, Indiana. And that came in the form of, I was working the third shift at a gas station and one night a young lady came in and I said, wow, she's very nice. I'd like to talk to her more, but I'm wearing a Speedway smock and I'm working the third shift and that's not necessarily the most appealing thing of a real winner in life. But she continued to come back. In fact, she came, we joke about this, she would come into the gas station every single night and buy $5 worth of gas. And, uh, and we began talking and we developed this friendship. Was she being intentional about what she was doing here? So, you know, if you would talk to her, I think she would say that she was not being intentional. She just wanted to have a friend. Right. And uh, now, I, I, and I could tell you, you know, I could invite her to come and talk to you because I married her. <laughs> and so, and I came to find out that she was a, a Christian that had, had some tough things happen in her life. And so she was not real active, but my interest in these questions kind of, kind of re, uh, reborn, so to speak, a, a desire to follow God. And she ended up taking me to church. And that sounds like she drug me to church. I wanted to go and we went to a couple of events at church. And for me, spirituality, was like taking a 10,000 piece puzzle, a 5,000 piece puzzle, a thousand piece puzzle, throwing it in a bag, mixing it all up, dumping it out and say, okay, put it together. And as I began to study the Bible and actually read the Bible, something amazing happened. I actually understood it. And as that picture formed, kind of like you, you know, you're, you know, you're, you know, I've got a mind that's clouded by all kinds of alcohol and all kinds of crazy stuff. And in this amazing way, and again, just like you, the, the Lord didn't ever speak to me yeah. audibly, mm -hmm. but things began to make sense and the puzzle began to fit together. Things began to be more clarified. That's correct. And you've been, you, you began to sense God's hand in all of this. That's right? right, that's right. What would you say to a person who's never picked up the Bible? You know, I, and I have the opportunity now to teach and, and to share about the Bible and what I encourage people to do especially if they've never ever picked up a Bible, is you have to start somewhere. And, the, and I say this, you know, I think the Lord can use any portion of the Bible, but there are certain pieces of the Bible and portions of the Bible that are a little bit more difficult. So I never encourage somebody to start in like, let's say Leviticus. Right. But what I encourage people to do is to open up the gospels. And for me specifically, the gospel that I encourage people to open in the gospels, of course, being the first four books of the New Testament, which is the latter portion of the Bible, is the Gospel of Mark. Mm. And the reason I encourage that, Anil, is that the Gospel of Mark is full of stories about this man named Jesus. And as I begin reading the Gospel of Mark and these stories, I begin to see in this man, Jesus, someone that was remarkable, mm -hmm that in the, in a world that was so opposed to him, in particular, the religious leaders were opposed to him, yet he was doing so much good. In fact, there, there's a Bible passage that I really like in the Gospel of John. John 3, 17 says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. And that word condemn elsewhere in the New Testament is translated judge but that the world through him might be saved. Wow. And that word saved, not to get too technical right now, but it's the Greek word sozo, which is translated deliverance from sin or, or save, but it's also translated to be made well or to be made whole. Wow. And when you begin to understand that this man Jesus walked on the earth with one goal in life, and that was to encounter people like Joshua, to encounter people like me, to encounter people like you, and make us whole physically, mentally, and spiritually. You know, Joshua talked about the book of Romans yes. and this idea of, of the gospel and yeah. it, how it brings about deliverance yeah. from the penalty of sin and the power of sin. That's right. 
Could you elaborate a little bit more on why the gospel, why righteousness by faith yes. is so important for every person to grasp? So, you know, it, we've used a couple of big words, righteousness and faith, which the word righteousness in its very essence means right doing. And then faith, it's very interesting in the Bible, the word faith and the word belief, it's the same identical original word. The Bible presents a real problem to us. And it says in the book of Isaiah, it says our righteousness. So because some people and I meet many of them, oh, I'm a good person. I do good things. And there are many good people in the world. But Isaiah presents this problem that our righteousness is like filthy rags. And the Hebrew imagery for that is not a pretty picture. So what do we do? One of my favorite texts is in 2 Corinthians 5, where the Bible presents this idea that Jesus walked on the earth and became sin for us. And again, we're using another big word here, sin. What is sin? Sin is a basically, according to 1 John 3, 4, is the breaking of God's law. And we face a real challenge because the book of Romans, as you were reading, yeah. <laughs> says that all have fallen short of keeping the commandments of God and that the wages of that sin is death. And that, you know, and I'm, I, I thought it was going to be a mathematician when I grew up. If you make that a logic statement, if everyone has sinned and the wages of sin is death, then therefore right. everyone will die. And that's not very encouraging. But the gospel is literally the good news that Second Corinthians 5 says that Jesus became sin for us. So he walked on the earth and he never committed sin. He lived a righteous life. And then 2 Corinthians 5 says, he became sin for us that then we become righteous. And if we stop there, then we're like, oh, okay, that's good news. In him. And that means that because Jesus lived this righteous life, and Romans 10, 9 says that if I believe that, and then I declare that, that Jesus died and rose from the dead for me, then that righteous life that he lived can be mine through faith, which is believing that Jesus did it. This concept that you're describing doesn't just have to do with the future hope. No. It has to do with the present Day reality. That is right. Uh, what, how does it impact our present day reality, our present relationship with God? And you know, if, I, if I'm being perfectly honest, when I first became a Christian, I became a Christian based on logic. But over time, I've had this experience where what I begin to understand is that I have a past that I've not even talked about that I'm ashamed of. But the Bible says I don't have to be ashamed, just like you, yeah. you know, God doesn't know you as a former prisoner. Yeah. God knows you as Joshua, the new person, yeah. because in my favorite passage of the Bible, 1 John 2, 1 says, my little children, I write these things to you that ye might not sin. But if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And just before that, in 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness, which is a beautiful thing. And there's a lot of concepts there. But in this concept, in this idea of righteousness by faith, what this means is when I embrace Jesus and I say, I believe this man lived a perfect life for me. And through that perfect life, I can then be made righteous or perfect. He also forgives our sins, which means that wages of sin is death. He actually embraces the second part of it, which says the gift of God is eternal life. So he forfeits that wage. But then it says he cleanses us of all unrighteousness, which means he takes our checkered past. And, you know, I'm old enough to remember the first day of school and a chalkboard. And I know a lot of young people have never seen a chalkboard in their life. But it was always my favorite day because it was actually black or it was actually green. And that's what God does for us. He takes that cloth and he wipes it away. That he doesn't know you as a former prisoner and he doesn't know me as an alcoholic. He knows me as Chris, 
the man who's after my own heart and is righteous because my son Jesus was righteous. So salvation isn't just this future hope we have, it's a present day experience we can have with God, which allows us to maintain this relationship with God. So Dr. Holland, we don't have to go, one day we're saved, one day we're lost, no. one day we're saved, a couple days we're lost, a couple days we're saved. No. Uh, when we trust God's grace here, we have this relationship with God, and if we mess up, Yes. We find grace and mercy in, in God immediately if we ask for it, and we get back up and continue this, this progressive walk with God. The Christian life is that when we fall, we don't stay down. Mm -hmm. Jesus as advocate, which literally means the one that stands next to us, reaches out his hand, and we reach out our hand, and he picks us up, and he dusts off our knees, and we keep walking that path for a hope now, and is there a hope in the future? There is a hope in the future, but the hope now is what Jesus said is he said, I want them to have life and life more abundantly. Right. So someone's probably watching this show and, and maybe they didn't grow up in a church or maybe come from a religious uh, background and it got this weight on them, yeah. this burden, maybe it's guilt, uh, maybe it's something else. What would you tell to a person like that? The first thing I would tell them is I would encourage them with these verses that I've read. God can take that all away. And it was a burden that I've once felt. And all God asks us to do is confess. And what does confessing mean? Is that I'm real with God and I say, listen, I failed, I'm miserable, I've done wrong things, and my life, I've made a mess of it. And sometimes we make a mess of our life, even when we've got a lot of money, a big house and a good wife and good husband and children, we've still made a mess of ourselves. Dr. Holland, what if I'm not near a church? What if there's not a priest I can talk to? How do I confess to God? <laughs> and that's the beauty. The beauty is the Bible says, Paul writing to Timothy says, there is no mediator between God and man except for Jesus Christ. And so the Bible says that we can speak to Jesus, we can speak to God directly and have access. In fact, Hebrews 4 promises that in prayer, we can come boldly before the throne, which again, there's a lot of concepts there, but what that means is, what is prayer? Prayer is talking to God like a friend. And if you read through the book of Psalms, which are a lot of prayers of, of David, it's not all this well-crafted English, it's, which for David would have been a Hebrew, but it's David just opening up his raw. heart. And sometimes, it's raw. And, and in prison, you know, I'm sure Joshua wasn't speaking King James English <laughs> to God. He said, Lord, my life stinks. I'm in a cell, I'm living in a four by four cell. I'm praying to the porcelain God on Sunday morning after a night out. And I'm saying, God, what can I do? And we cry out. And then the Bible promises in Matthew 6, if we seek the righteousness of God first, seek his kingdom first, he will add all these things unto us that we might live a life full of hope, full of joy. And what Isaiah 22 promises, the product of righteousness in our life is peace. Wow. And that's a foreign concept to many. Right, right. But that's what the product of righteousness is. So that's beautiful because what we're talking about here is that we don't need to go through life with burdens no. and this weight and this crushing guilt. Uh, God wants us to be in, a, in a, an experience of peace. Amen. Yeah. Right? And, and like the Bible says, the effect of, of righteousness is this quietness and this peace that comes from it, right? Absolutely. And, and, and I'm sure that does good for our bodies and our minds and our hearts, That's right? right? That's right. That's beautiful. Well, it's time to go to our break, but when we come back, we'll get to hear some questions from our live audience for our guests tonight. So don't go away. Welcome back to Hope at Night. We've been talking about the biblical concept of righteousness by faith, or how can we find freedom from our habits and hangups through faith in God. I'd like to turn to our live in-studio audience. 
First of all, did any of the material presented resonate with any of you? Right over there. Hi, I'd just like to say that um, your story really touched me. And um, many times in my life, I've thought, oh, my life is over after something happened. But hearing your stories, which was way more hugely impacted, made me realize that God will always have a way for us. Amen. So thank you. Amen. Amen. Right. That's beautiful. You know, that's why the Bible tells us God is called the God of hope, right? Yeah. He gives us hope when we need it the most. Amen. We have anyone else? Right over there. I'm 74 years old. Now, when I was 40 years old, I was in the hospital dying and I celebrated my 40th birthday laying on my back, literally praying to die because I had a ruptured pancreas. The pain was so intense. I had experimental surgery wow. coming up and I was at the lowest point I ever was. And that's I understand where you guys are coming from, that, that low point mm -hmm. when there's no one else or nothing else to turn to but God. And you are literally with your back up against the wall. And that this, this whole episode resonated with me incredibly. That's beautiful. Yeah. Wonderful. Do we have anyone else? Right over there. Yeah. I just want to say, first of all, thank you guys for sharing your story. It's, it helps everybody. Um, and it's just sort of an observation. It seems that it was when you were at your very most rock bottom, even thoughts of suicide, that God spoke to you or came to you. Why did it take that much pain to finally find God? We all have to get to a point where we can hear the voice of God um, calling us. And, you know, we all have distractions from sin and from the world. And some have bigger distractions, some have smaller distractions. But nevertheless, we're distracted with the world and sin. And we have to get to a point in our life where, where we're able to hear the voice of God. And it is unfortunate that some of us have to get to the lowest point. You see stories in the Bible of um, people becoming demon-possessed. And that's the point that they had to get to see their need of Christ. And we don't have to get to that point. You know, we don't have, we have the opportunity today to serve the Lord, but, but a lot of times we have to get to the point where we're able to hear, hear the voice of God speaking to us. Yeah, and I was just, I was just gonna add, it's an interesting question that you ask because uh, I have the opportunity now where I teach all around the world, uh, you know, the Bible. And, and for me personally, it was bringing me to a point where I recognize my need. And, and sometimes we don't even recognize our need, and especially for men, uh, and I don't want to be too stereotypical, but you know, like the doctor, I, I don't need to go to the doctor. What needs to happen before I need, like something major needs to happen and then I'll go to the doctor. And, and it's kind of interesting, the Bible calls Jesus the great physician, and it's interesting for women more than men, women often don't need to be brought to that bottom point. There is a recognition of that need. Uh, but uh, it, it's kind of like um, sometimes when people want to have their child <laughs> drink more water because they need to drink more water, they'll give them something salty uh, because the child doesn't want to drink water. But then in order to recognize, hey, you're actually thirsty, mm -hmm. you, they put a little salt or I mean, and there are many different examples of of that. And I think I think in the same way, God in his mercy allows for us to go to a place where then we're willing to yeah. cry out mm -hmm. like you were crying out, you know, when you're about to die because you're in so much pain. And so I know that's what it was for me. Mm -hmm. And even now, having spent 27 years as a Christian, there are those kind of little valleys in life where God uses those valleys and I want to be very careful because sometimes people will say God brings the valleys. I don't know that God brings the valleys. Mm. God allows for those valleys for you to be with him. And if I could just add this one thing, Anil, that there is a brand of Christianity today that preaches the idea that once you come to Jesus, everything's going to be okay. You know, your life is going to be perfect and all these kinds of things. But I believe the God of the Bible is one that allowed three Hebrew boys in Daniel chapter three to go into the fiery furnace. God doesn't always necessarily keep us from problems, but God takes us by the hand and walks through that problem with us. And it's in the midst of that problem that we can look over and say, oh, wait, you're there. He's been there the whole time, but we didn't recognize him until we were in that mm. big trouble.
Mm. Yeah, even Jesus himself said, yeah. in this world you will have trouble. Yes. But he'll be with us. That's mm. right. All right, That's wonderful. Right. We have any more questions? <clears throat> right over there. Hi, um, I was wondering how someone can become righteous after being unrighteous. Dr. Harlan, would you like to take that one? Sure, sure. There's a couple of Bible verses that talk through that, um, and in its simplicity, I mentioned a couple of them, but um, the book of Isaiah talks about that even though your sins be as scarlet, and if you've ever if you've ever gotten a blood stain, you know, this is one of the, you know, we try all the little home remedies, spray, hairspray on it, and you're trying to get it out. And so that's the picture it's painting. It shall be made white as snow. And it's kind of one of those um, tensions of the Bible that somehow the blood of Jesus makes us clean. Mm. It doesn't make sense. But when we think about what blood does, blood carries out impurities. Uh, there are many physicians that talk about healthy circulation means a healthy person because your blood's flowing. And so what does the Bible say? How can you go from being unrighteous to being righteous? And, I, I, and I'm going to add a little phrase to your question. Righteous is in him because we can't be righteous ourselves. First John 1 John 1.9 says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, speaking of Jesus, to forgive us our sins. The word forgiveness in its most technical sense is God relinqu relinquishing his right to retaliate and then cleanse us from all unrighteousness, which means that then God wipes the unrighteousness. Now, how does that happen? The Bible doesn't tell us exactly how the blood of Christ carries away that righteousness. It just states it as a fact. And how I illustrate that is, is I'm not an electrician. I know when I go in my room, I flip on the switch and the light comes on. Mm -hmm. Even though I don't understand it, how electricity works, I don't sit in the dark all the time. I turn on the light. And so that is presented there. And then in 1 John 2, 1 and 2, 2, the Bible says, my little children, these things I'm writing to you that you might not sin. So after we experience that, God's goal is that we would live a life of righteousness in Him. Mm -hmm. But we may have moments where we stumble. Mm -hmm. And when we stumble, the Bible says he's our advocate. He comes up next to us and, and gets us back up. And then 1 John 2, 2 uses this big theological term and says he is the propitiation. Mm -hmm. Newer versions say atoning sacrifice. What it basically means is that Jesus paid the price for us. So not only does Jesus stand next to us when we stumble, but then, and this is now I'm talking about I'm a Christian, I've made a decision, I've been cleansed, I've been forgiven, I'm living that life and I do an unrighteous act. I am made righteous again because Jesus paid the price for that unrighteous act mm -hmm. that then he makes me righteous again. And like you said earlier, it's not that we're in and out of salvation, it's that he's keeping us righteous mm -hmm. at all times by standing next to us and even though we may stumble, he removes that from us and, and brings us into that right state with him of righteousness. Right. Hopefully that answers the question. And it, it's such a beautiful concept that when God looks upon you, he doesn't see your, no. your past, your mistakes, your faults. He, he sees his perfect son who lived a perfect life, who scored victories after victories Amen. where we fell, and, and we become the object of divine delight. Joshua. And just to add to that too, the Bible says a very encouraging um, verse. It says that a righteous man falls seven times, but rises up again. And so unfortunately, sometimes the righteous man, the Christian, we have these moments of stumbling and falling. And, but it says we get back up. So a righteous man falls seven times, but gets back up. So. Right. You look at the story of Peter and Judas. Yeah. Uh, quantitatively, yeah. Peter fell more times in the gospel than <laughs> Judas did, right? Yeah, that's true. But Peter got back up. Every time. Yeah. Right. And Every beautiful. time. Just adding one brief thing, and the beauty of the Bible stories, which helps us understand that the Bible is true, the Bible doesn't hide the lives of yeah. the major figures. All right. Mm -hmm. David's life, <laughs> you know, we've yeah. shared a little of our story. David yeah. killed by having a man murdered, he committed adultery. Oh. He, you know, the list goes, he lied, he did all these things. The beauty of the story of the gospel is God never gave up on David. Yeah. 
he just kept coming after him. And this is then where David says in Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, O God. And that's what he did. Uh, and so the Bible doesn't necessarily talk about the process by which it happens, but that we just ask mm -hmm. and God does it. Amen. It'd be a pretty discouraging book if the Bible was just full of perfect people. <laughs> it would be very <laughs> discouraging. <laughs> Have we got another question? Yeah. Right over there. We've been talking about people being at their lowest ebb when they reach out. I just want to to say something more to give hope to those people who, having been at the lowest edge, I would like to see people get help when they're down that low. That's, yeah. so anything you can say to add sure. hope to them would mm. be appreciated. Joshua, let's start with you. Yeah, we have so many stories in the Bible of, of we have Mary Magdalene, you know, who was a prostitute. We have the demon possessed, the demon possessed men. And so it doesn't matter how low we get, but Christ, Christ is always willing and always able to come to us in any, in any place in life. I, I've actually learned that I don't want to encourage anybody to come to their lowest point, but it's almost like the lowest that a human being can get is the time that Christ really comes, comes through and shows his power and when he can show his power to people. And so, yeah, I, I just always want to encourage people that it doesn't matter how, how low in life you are, that Christ, Christ can give you power. That's beautiful. And, and I just, I, I think, the beauty of it is, is that, as I was saying earlier, God is there all the time. And that is so encouraging. And, 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 and again, the only analogy that I can give is, uh, you know, when you're in a swimming pool and if you have trouble swimming, when you're sinking is when you feel your need for air mm -hmm. and you feel it pretty dramatically. And the imagery is Jesus, God is right there that as we're sinking, he grabs us yeah. mm -hmm. and he pulls us up to get that air. And he works with us sometimes in spite of ourselves, because sometimes, as you were saying, you don't want to encourage people to go to the bottom, but some of us unfortunately treasure being at the bottom and we think that life is really good at the bottom. <laughs> And maybe sometimes God needs to leave us under the water just a little bit yeah. to help us understand fresh air is a whole lot better yeah. than a lungs full of water. Right. There's a quote from a, a Christian author that I really admire. And she says that Christ delights to take apparently hopeless material, those yeah. whom Satan has debased and through whom he has worked and make them the subjects of his grace. Yeah, yeah. So that's Christ's, Christ's delight. And that's what yeah. we see he did with Mary Magdalene, what he see we did with the demon possessed man. And that's, yeah, and I believe that that's what he did to me. Right. And so that's his, that's his delight. The, the Psalms are full of prayers. Yeah. David crying out and others, I'm cried out to you from my lowest yeah. pit and you heard me. Amen. Amen. That's beautiful. Do we have any other questions? Right over there. Yes, this question is for Josh. Um, while you were in prison, did you ever experience any um, any bitterness towards God for your situation? You know, I was, when I think about that, that question, I can honestly say no, because I never had no concept. I never, I never even considered God. Like being raised up in the family I was raised up in, like, you know, being raised, um, I, well, how do I say this? You know, whenever I learned that, you know, Santa Claus wasn't real and the Easter money wasn't real and that the tooth fairy wasn't real, to me, the stories of the Bible weren't real either. So, so growing up, I just, I just put those out of my mind. I never considered them. So I didn't, I didn't have a God to be bitter towards or to be angry towards. And my first experience of learning about God, it was, it was beautiful. And it was like, oh, wow, praise the Lord. He's, he's like, oh, and then I can look back and I see how God was always with me. Because I have some stories of how, I, I mean, I shouldn't be here, but God had angels protecting me so many times in my life when I didn't even know him and when I was not serving him. Right. So when I learned about God, I saw his love for me all throughout my life. And, and when I say all throughout my life, I mean a lot of bad things, but I see how God used all of them for good yeah. to be a blessing to me. I, I don't regret anything in my life. You know, I can see how God has used it all to draw me closer to him and help me see a need of him. So yeah, I can honestly say I've never had, never had any bitterness towards God, but, but I, I love the Lord. <laughs> yeah. Amen. That's been a, this has been a very beautiful discussion. Yeah. You know, and I was just thinking as we we're talking, I think all of us, we get to heaven one day, like the most righteous people in scripture from Abraham to Moses, all of them are gonna have the same story yeah. 
I was a sinner saved by grace. Amen. Amen. That's right. Amen. right. Beautiful. Well, this really has been a message of hope today. We all struggle with different things. In Romans chapter seven, Paul talks about how he struggles with doing the things he doesn't want to do and not doing the things he wants to do. In fact, Paul laments, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. But then he shares these words of hope. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The gospel teaches us that our worst days, our darkest days are not our last days or our final days. God provides pardon for the past and power for the present. And he promises to walk with us each step of that upward way. If this good news resonates with you, we want to hear it. Follow us on Facebook at Hope at Night and let us know there. Also, if you want to find out more about any of what has been discussed, or if you'd like to get a digital copy of some of the books mentioned today, please let us know too. That's all for now, but we'll see you next week for more Hope at Night.